Cool. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Luigi Montanez. I um, have been a Ruby developer since around 2006 or so. And I used to live here in the area. Um, I moved away to DC for about four years and I just moved back. So it's great to be back in Atlanta. Um, so as you can tell from the topic of this talk, uh, this is all about our feelings. And we're going to talk about our feelings. No, it's about MongoDB. Um, but before I do that, uh, just a quick shout out your answers. You are mostly all Rubyists or Rails developers. Why, why do y'all like Ruby? Why do y'all like Rails? Just sh shout it out. It's not lame. Not lame. <laughs> Doesn't get in your way. Doesn't get in your way. Anything else? Uh, it's fun. It's Great. Good community. Okay, cool. So keep all those positives in mind, um, and you'll see kind of how those reflect uh, Mongo. So I started using Mongo, like I said, I moved up to DC about four years ago, and I worked for this nonprofit called the Sunlight Foundation. And the, the first project I worked on there was uh, this government data catalog. So Sunlight is a, is a nonprofit that focuses on government transparency and open government. And so we were building this kind of metadata catalog about data sets that were being released by governments all around the country. And so me and my uh, partner who we worked on this, we thought, well, there's this new thing called Mongo. This was back in 2009. And we know it's schemaless, so we don't really know the schema of all these data sets. And we, we don't know the metadata um, that we're, we're going to be collecting. So let's, let's go with some schemaless database. And so we used Mongo, and it worked out pretty well. Uh, flash forward about a year later, I built another app. This is called Polygraphed, and this kind of uh, accepts a news article or any article on the web. It scans it, um, looking for uh, politicians and companies and organizations, and it, on the right here, it kind of tells all about um, campaign finance, co campaign contribution data. And again, this was bringing disparate data sources into one uh, into one thing, so it was good to use Mongo for, for the schemaless nature of it. And it was around this time when Mongo kind of became my default data store, when I, I was using it for all the Greenfield apps, I, all the Greenfield Rails apps I was building. So I now work for a startup called Upworthy, or a viral media startup, and the app is essentially just a, a CMS, it's a glorified CMS. And at the beginning, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to use Mongo again because I'm, Mongo does content management pretty well. And yeah, it worked really good. Um, so I started to ask myself, why is it after this was now maybe three or four years I've been using Mongo, why do I keep coming back to it and not going with my SQL or Postgres or something else? Um, and there are a lot of like technical reasons behind this, and I'm, I'll go over that. But uh, the simplest reason is that using Mongo makes me happy. So, uh, who knows who this is? Mats, right. Mats is the creator of Ruby on Rails, and he is most, one of his most famous quotes, of course, is, Ruby is designed to make programmers happy. So he, uh, he designed Ruby not optimized for speed or for concurrency or for any really specific features, he optimized it for happiness. And 37 Signals, the, the, the folks who made uh, Ruby on Rails way back when, they wrote this in their ebook called Getting Real, which was their first ever ebook. Happiness has a cascading effect. Happy programmers do the right thing. They write simple, readable code. They take clean, expressive, elegant approaches, and they have fun. So happiness directly translates to the quality of your work. Uh, it leads to strong collaboration because happy programmers tend to work better together, naturally. Here's another quote from Matz. I'll just read it aloud. Programmers often feel joy when they can concentrate on the creative side of programming. A lot of those values, I think, translate really well to Mongo. So, uh, who here has just kind of played with Mongo, tried it out on your computer, maybe? How many folks have it uh, in production or using it on the production app? Cool. 
So for those of you who, are, who aren't so familiar with it, what you can think of Mongo is as a kind of um, a database where you store collections of schemaless JSON documents. So the first part of that is schemaless, so you don't define your schema in the database. Um, Mongo doesn't care about what the schema is, and instead, as you'll see, you actually define your schema in your app, in your Rails app, or whatever app you're using. And it uses JSON, so your data, your data is stored as JSON, as JavaScript object notation, which almost all web developers, I'm sure, are familiar with. So from this simple design, design decision, uh, I think that leads to developer happiness. And so how, how does that happen? Well, my first idea is that using Mongo leads to genuine, uh, real choice in how you store your data. So five years ago, 10 years ago, when you were to say, name some databases for me, these are probably the ones you would think of. Uh, they're all relational, they're all SQL based, they're all big relational systems. Um, and if you were working on a Rails app and you were building, let's say, a blog, um, you would, let's say you're handed this wireframe by a client or by your boss and they said, build this app for us in Rails, and you would think about, well, how am I going to persist this data? So as a thought exercise, let's figure out how we would actually store that in, in Rails. So in, excuse me, in uh, the relational model. So you'd have a blog posts main table, right? And it would have the title, the slug, content. Uh, up top, there's the author, and there would be, of course, a foreign key back to, um, uh, I'm sorry, the blog post would have a foreign, foreign key to the author. And then at the bottom of the wireframe, there's the comments section. So of course you need a comments table and each comment points back with a foreign key to the original blog post. And then in the sidebar, there's this recommended section. And usually you don't really store something like that. You'd probably just run a query dynamically to, to figure that out. And then you have tags. So of course the right way to do this, of course, is you have a tags table, but then you need, it's a many to many relationships. So of course you need that blog posts, tags, join table. And this is pretty much the right way to go about it in the relational world, right? That's the, the straightforward right thing to do. Um, and then you would go to the decision, well, what database am I gonna use? And there'd be obviously many decisions. What, what's your uh, architecture? What, what are, is your infrastructure on? Uh, how much money do you wanna spend? And you would pick which, which of those databases you'd wanna use. But the reality is the, the difference between these, these major four players in the relational world um, is actually much smaller when you consider the NoSQL explosion that happened around 2009 or so. And when all these NoSQL databases start getting used and popular and, and uh, mature, you had things like document databases like Couch and Mongo you had uh, key value stores like Redis, React, graph databases, column-based databases. And the difference between the main relational databases actually wasn't that much in, in contrast to all the NoSQL options that we now had. So I think that NoSQL is really the end of dogma about how you store data, how the way you do things, the rules that say that you need to store uh, your data in rows which are in tables and you need to normalize everything and you uh, you run large joins during runtime all this sort of dogma kind of gets thrown out the window when you have other tools like NoSQL the, the various NoSQL databases that have popped up so I think what choice really brings is this kind of sense of creative control over how you're building your app and how you persist the data within your app so uh, to, to make an analogy, in, in Hollywood, powerful directors, when they're making a movie, they always demand final cut, meaning what their vision, their exact vision, is, is what makes it to, to the screen, is what makes it to the movie. So I think we as software developers should also start thinking the same way. 
And I think that the relational model in many ways actually inhibits our creative control. So go back to this blog post example, and um, this is what it looks like for the relational model. And now think about like what's the most natural way to, to persist this in a Rails app, right? If you're using a Rails app and you're, you don't need to use a relational database, what would you use? Well, you might want to use, you just want to wish that you could just somehow store Ruby objects on the disk, right? Um, and there have been various, actually, uh, various attempts at that, but nothing's uh, quite worked out. So I think the second best thing is what Mongo does, which is you store JSON documents onto disk. And JSON is a great format because it is object-oriented and it works well with pretty much all the other modern languages out there. So this is what um, uh, the blog post would look like persisted in JSON. And as a developer using Mongo, you can pretty much think of the persistence as this. So it's, it's a rich nested structure. Um, you got your title, published, content. Those are just key values, very straightforward. And then author gets a bit interesting. So remember, I, I want to store my author and author, author name for my uh, blog app here. And so uh, you can actually just store the data right there. So you just store the ID, maybe if there's a separate ID for somewhere else. And then you just store the name right there as an embedded object, right? Because this is just JSON, and you can nest JSON like this. And then you have uh, tags. So we have tags on the sidebar. So instead of making a join table and then uh, making another table and, and dealing with all that, you can just store tags as, as an array because tags are that. They're just an array of strings, right? So you just store it right there in the blog post document. And then you're going to have a series of comments. So in, instead of storing comments in a separate table, let's just stick them with the blog post. And here it's an array of more JSON documents, right? So here's your first comment, and you have your name, your email, and the comment text. Even the recommended section here in the sidebar in the top, uh, top right, you could theoretically just store that in Mongo. So let's say after save or after update, you have a callback, and it just populates this uh, uh, like three or four recommended blog posts to go along with um, with the blog post that's being displayed. So instead of a, a blog post needing five distinct tables to render itself through Rails, um, you just have one document. And so you, what you do is you just pluck out that document from Mongo, you maybe by ID, maybe by whatever, and you have everything you need there to render the document. So uh, I like to say that Mongo is this new sort of WYSIWYG, right? So WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. But Mongo is what you store is what you get. So you can really think of uh, the mapping between what is on your app screen to uh, what is persisted in the, the database. database. Yep. yep. <laughs> There, yeah, yeah there, there, there actually, actually usually is. is. Um, I just okay. left it out. It's in Mongo. It's a, um, it's a glo it's a GUI, a GUID. It's uh, just a, like a sixteen or twenty four character, uh, unique string. But I just left it out for here. But you have the option of, of making it of having one. So. Um, What also happens is that you kind of have re true outside-in development, right? So outside-in development says you're supposed to start with the design first, uh, code the, the user level uh, expectations, the, what, you'd, what you'd spec out with Cucumber or something like that. Um, so the high-level features, and then you work your way down the stack. When you're using Mongo, um, the, what you're actually building you are really able to quickly visualize and, and grok what, how that's going to be persisted. So in, in this sense, your app is really driving your data schema rather than you have this data schema and then you're kind of struggling to make it work with your app. So another aspect of Mongo um, is 
that's really adaptable to change. So as Rails developers, as Ruby developers, we know that the requirements of the apps we build, they always change over, our life, uh, over the app's lifetime. So your stakeholder, your customer, your boss will come to you with a, a new idea for a feature or um, a modification to an existing feature. And we as developers have to be really agile and lean and responsive to change. And so Mongo is really great at that. So here's an example of how, how one feature can change over time. So on Upworthy, um, we have uh, really clean URLs. Like that's something we want for various SEO reasons and stuff like that. So our URL is just our domain slash the, the title of the post. So that's the initial requirement when you first built the app, just a slug, right? So you got the title and then you slugify it and then that goes in the URL. So how does that look like in Mongo? So here um, is an example of what, of a truncated version of what the post uh, document might look like. So here's an ID, this has an ID with a unique ID. An object ID is just Mongo's way of, of making a, uh, of making a new ID or referencing an ID. And then you have your headline, which is just a key with uh, the actual headline, which is a string, and then you have slug, which is again, just a string, right? Straightforward. Then a few weeks later, we get a new requirement. We actually want many headlines and slugs per post because we want to optimize our content because we're trying to be viral media and we want to try out different things but we want to assign all these headlines to the same post. So immediately in the relational model, what you would do is you would immediately um, denormalize, right? You would say, oh, well, I need a separate headlines table, and then I need a separate slugs table, and they need to be primary, they need to have foreign keys back up to the posts. So there, right away you have three different tables. But with Mongo, you can actually just kind of put those right into the original document. So you have headlines. So headlines now, instead of, head, uh, instead of the key being headline, a single headline with the value being a string, you have headlines, which is an array that has many strings in them, right? So now you can store all your strings there. Slugs is the same. You can store all your slugs in there. Now this is all self-contained within a single document. You're, it's still a single post document. And what happens here is, well, when you need to actually migrate the schema, uh, you don't have to tell Mongo. You don't actually run a Rails migration telling, them, telling Mongo uh, that you have this new schema. You just do it. And instead, the actual database migrations that you end up running are actually about migrating data. They're not just about changing your schema because you have no, Mongo has no concept of a schema to change. So in this case, the data migration would be, well, for that old field, which was just called headline, um, now it's a new field called headlines and it's an array and attach the new array as the first, uh, attach the original array as the first, uh, attach the original headline as the first item in the array. So then, a few weeks later, you're working on your app and there's a new requirement for this feature. And says, they say, well, we want to actually store impression counts for each slug because we're, we're testing which of these variations of these headlines and slugs are the most popular and we want to store impression data. You just want the counts. So you just kind of modify the document again. So here, um, I'll just show you the slugs um, the slugs sub object. So instead of being an array of strings, it's now an array of objects, JSON objects. And each JSON object has two values, a slug, excuse me, two keys, a slug, which is what we had before, and then another, another key called impressions, which has the impression count. So again, we're still all in the, the post collection. Now there's another requirement that comes a few weeks later and they say, well, we actually want to track slugs across different content types. So we have posts on the site now, but we want uh, an author page, we want uh, a topic page, we, we want to build out the website more. So now we have slugs that can mean different things, right? Or, or can be applied to different kinds of objects. 
And now at this point, um, this is a dedicated slug document. At this point we say, well, it's not really going to work to just store them with every, a slug with every single kind of object we have in our database. Instead, we're just going to have this slugs um, collection. And here we see we, there's a, a pointer to the parent ID, which is kind of like a foreign key. We store the parent type, so we know that this is pointing to a post. And then we store what we had before, which is the slug and the oppression count. So what I liked about this is that it was we kind of used the best solution each step of the way. In the relational world, you would immediately denormalize. Here, we kind of did the right thing that felt the most natural to our, our data and how we were actually using it in our Ruby app. And then only at the end did we feel the need to actually separate slugs into their own collection. So uh, another aspect of Mongo that I really like is that it's, it's very general purpose and it works in many situations, particularly for us web developers. First and foremost, this is mostly due to the fact that it stores everything in JSON. So just this one decision eliminates a lot of friction. Um, JSON, of course, is everyone's favorite data exchange format, especially for APIs. Every language out there supports it. JSON, of course, is JavaScript, and Mongo's native query language is JavaScript. So be, here you see uh, in the first example, this is how you would actually find all the, uh, the blog posts that are tagged with MongoDB. So it's just a dot find function that you call, and you pass in a JSON object. In this case, it's just a very simple object that's tags and MongoDB. So the Ruby driver for Mongo is really just a very simple wrapper around this. It looks almost the same. With Ruby, there's a method called find, and you pass in a hash. You also don't need an ORM, really, when you use Mongo. Or when you use Mongo. So, when you think of what an ORM is, it's ob the object relational mapper. And ORMs exist because objects and the relational model, um, they're actually pretty far apart. Like So when you think about a Ruby object and you think about how a record is stored in a database, there's a lot of mapping that needs to be done, obviously, and, and they're pretty far apart. And that's why ORMs like Active Record are so useful because they bridge the gap between uh, Ruby's object model and the relational model. With Mongo, um, you're not, you don't have the relational model, you have tables, instead you have JSON documents, so the mapping is actually much narrower, right? There's, the gap is smaller. So what we have in Mongo, they're called ODMs, or object document mappers, and the most popular one is called Mongoid, and they're much, uh, a much smaller uh, gap between what they're doing for you. So ODMs essentially they convert Mongo JSON objects into Ruby, and then they decorate those objects with callbacks and validations, stuff you'd expect in, from the Rails world. So this is an example of what defining some classes in Mongoid, the most popular uh, Ruby ODM, looks like. So you have a class called Artist, and uh, in order to get all the Mongoid features, you just include the document. And then here's where you actually define the schema. This is a very simple schema. Uh, so you define the schema right in the model class. So field is name, type string. Obviously you can have many and many, many more of these of, of all sorts of types. You can have type of array, you can have type of hash, and it just all works. And then uh, it embeds many instruments. So this is the embedded object. So because we're dealing with JSON, we can embed objects inside. And in this case, we're embedding instruments, which is defined right below it, which, uh, again, is just very simple as a name, and then it's embedded in the parent's artist class. And then you just access it using very idiomatic Ruby. It just looks great. Unlike um, with Active Record, you know, you're never going to write SQL because there's no concept of passing along strings that act as a query. You're always writing Ruby. Mongo also ships with what I call a bunch of mi minimum viable features that work uh, with you to, to help you as you're building your apps. So there's full text search, there's geospatial indexing for mapping, um, there's aggregations when you want to sum and 
find averages of things. So full text search, um, this is in, in JavaScript, but um, it's very straightforward. You call this function to create the index. In this case, this is ensuring the index on uh, the title and the content of a blog post. And then below it, you just query it. You say dot run command with what kind of command? A text search command. And you just pass, pass along the search term. So this also does stemming and confidence scores and all that. With geospatial, if you ever have to map things in your web app, if you need to map people or places or whatever, uh, you can create a geospatial index. It's here. It's in the shipping address. So shipping address dot loc is going to have this type of, uh, of a geospatial point. That's, that's geojson. And then your coordinates. You then build an index around that. So address dot loc. You say it's a 2D sphere index. And then in your query, uh, the query again is just a call to dot find, and then you pass in a JSON object in Ruby. This would be a Ruby hash, and it's just saying uh, you want the query near this point, and then the geometry uh, you have a geometry um, flag there, and you give it some coordinates. You give it the max distance in miles, and it just it tells you what you want, which is all the addresses within 100 miles of this point. With aggregations, um, so let's say you want to uh, have a sales, so you want to have sales totals for each state. So you would group, uh, pass in the group operator, then you pass in what you are grouping by, which is in this case the state of the billing address, and then you create some aggregation. In this case, uh, it's called sales totals and is the sum of the total of each individual order. So just really straightforward, uh, just giving you a taste of what the, the queries look like. So of course, not everything is happy land with Mongo. And so I'm just going to talk about some of the caveats, some of the gotchas that uh, I've come across. So the biggest thing to, the biggest hurdle is it's not relational, right? So there's no native joins. So uh, this is a problem if you need things that are very relational. If your app is highly relational, if all the objects are talking to each other and referencing each other, Mongo is probably not a good fit for you. There are no transactions. Uh, so a lot of people expect transactions in a database. That's very necessary in relational databases. But there's no native transactions in Mongo. Um, if you're using your database outside the context of your app, that might be a problem, especially for things like analytics. If you have like someone uh, who comes in and is essentially an analyst and wants to like really learn Grok things and, and find insights from your database, um, they're going to have a hard time because uh, the data model is much more attuned to what your how your Rails app or how your app uses it rather than being in some generalizable form. And so at, at uh, Upworthy, we actually had this problem where we had analysts on staff, and they wanted to analyze the data about um, our site. And uh, like we have posts and impressions and, and all that sort of analytical stuff. And so we actually use something called MoSQL, M-O-S-Q-L, which is a bridge from Mongo to Postgres and BigQuery uh, Postgres. And Mongo is pretty bad for those huge monolithic Rails apps that we all know and love, right? So when you when you have a Rails app and there's dozens of models, and um, you have a few like thousand line God classes that like do like all these sorts of things, um, it's hard to uh, make Mongo fit in that. So there's actually some really good advice from the creators of Mongo, the, the most popular Mongo ODM. They say, if you find that you have more relational associations in your app uh, than the embedded associations, it's recommended that you actually don't use Mongo and move to something relational. And they're going to actually probably remove um, their feature of, ha of kind of mimicking uh, foreign keys from, from, their, from Mongoid. So the solution is to, instead of having these huge apps that have a lot of relations, to actually have many smaller and focused apps uh, that work together in concert, and each app focuses on its own thing. And that's kind of like the right SOA way to go about building large systems anyway. 
And there are also some pretty good alternatives uh, that kind of share Mongo's philosophy that are out there. So surprisingly, Postgres in the last few years actually has done a lot, a lot of really great work um, to provide us with more natural types of persistence for our Ruby objects. So in Postgres, there's now an array field type. So you can have an array of tags, for example, and you can index it and query it, and it works great. There's something called hstore, which is essentially a hash. And in Rails 4, there's native support for the ability to actually just store Ruby hashes right in your model. And they can be arbitrary key value pairs. So if you ever have things like custom fields, or if you're gathering data and you don't know the name of the fields beforehand, um, you can just use hstore and it'll work as you would think a hash, a Ruby hash would work. And there's also, uh, in the next release of Postgres, there's going to be JSON support with the ability to actually query into JSON um, and just do all the things you'd expect to do with JSON. There's another database called RethinkDB. And this is a lot like uh, Mongo. It's a JSON-based document store. The biggest difference and the biggest improvement upon Mongo is that it does support native joins. So you do get what people are used to, which is joining together different tables. Um, in this case, instead of joining relational tables, you're joining JSON documents. So this is very new, I think. Um, I only have learned about it in the past few months, but um, I'll definitely keep my eye, eye out on it, eye out for it. So uh, to recap, um, I think that Mongo has this kind of schemaless documented, document oriented structure. And that means that we as developers have this choice over how we, we store our data. And we can uh, store the data in the way that best fits for our apps. Um, I get choice over how I model my schemas. I get control over how I store my data. And with JSON as the data format, um, it plays well it plays really well with how we think of objects in Ruby. And it also has a bunch of really uh, good features like full text search and geo um, that just are kind of great to rely on when you're building uh, a Rails app. So uh, that's all I have. I think that uh, my big takeaway is when we think of Ruby and Rails and, and those technologies bringing developer happiness, um, try to think of other places in your development stack where you can introduce the same happiness, right? where you can be, uh, where you can look forward to using your, to your tools. So I talked about the data store here, but um, think about all the other aspects of, of your workflow and um, create your own definition of developer happiness. So that's it, thank you. Questions? Does Mongo have the changes API of any sort? A what API? Changes, like can you monitor a Mongo database for changes to a certain collection? I assume items in Mongo are indexed, like you have post slash go right. would be like your ID, unless you fix the different kinds of ID format. Um, there's a, there is a log file that obviously you can check on the log bait, on the log level. Um, Mongoid, the Mapper has a version versioning um, plugin that would let, lets you version your documents. Um, is that where you're? Not specifically. Uh, I use another, a different document store database. It has a changes API, which is really hmm. nice. Um, what was it called? RavenDB. Awesome. It's a .NET cool. um, relational, or not relational, a document store. Cool. But it maintains like a connection. It'll notify you. Uh, yeah, you might not use that. You probably wouldn't use that necessarily in like the front end aspect of a Rails web app. You, know, you might use that on background workers or, cool. or something else like that. So I, I don't think Mongo has that specifically. But it sounds like a great feature. Any other? Yep. I wanted to ask, like, what, what's a good situation to use Mongo in? Like, you say it's not good for us, like transactional databases. How about, like, I think, um, like I said, I use it as my default for most web apps. I think it's a great fit for almost all web apps. If it's, if you're not you like, if you're not building a banking site or something where you need that strict trend, the transactional support. Um, if you're just 
creating any general web app, like e-commerce, I think that would be pretty good. Um, it's, I think my recommendation is just to try it on like something small first and see how it works for you and see how it fits your mental model. Um, and then work from there. But like I said, I think it's, it's a pretty good general solution. You were mentioning actually <coughs> using a bridge over to a SQL, I forget the name of the tool you're It's called MoSQL, M-O, SQL. Yeah, SQL, M-O, which is kind of, to me, that surprised me a little bit because actually when I've done some analytics-based um, applications, we initially stored in Mongo because of the fact that you're gathering so much data and you know, storing that in SQL up would actually run us into problems later on. Um, how were you dealing with, were you doing segmentation before you were bringing data over into Postgres or what were you doing to kind of mitigate that? Um, we, well, first of all, we, we only bring over the data we need, which is kind of live profile site activity data. Um, and just, it's for analyzing that. So that's the first, so we, we were already somewhat limited, like we were already limiting our data flow. Um, but it was, they were very large data sets. So I think that Mongo is good for analytics when you know the questions you're going to ask later, right? When you can store, like, when you can build your documents in a way that you know this is how I'm going to query those documents later. It's not so good when you're running queries that are ad hoc, that you, they're at, asking questions that you just couldn't have thought of before. And in that sense, because it's, there's no joins and because everything's in one big document, it's a bit harder to kind of glean out the insights that you usually could in a relational schema. But what if you don't actually know when you're collecting the data, even how you're going to be using that? Yeah. Because then you're running into that relational issue with it, though, as well. So in other words, if you've got a relational database and you have no idea what you're going to do with it. You just want to store a bunch of stuff, and some right. of those fields may even change. Uh, you see what I'm saying with yeah, that? Yeah, no. Let's create reports off of it. So when someone's like, well, what, how do we get the analytics, which always happens, right? You're like, oh, well, that's a mini project. We write these queries, and now you have your analytics. Is yeah. that what you're going for? Yeah, so, so, yeah. It's, so Mon yeah, Mongo is good when you actually don't know how you're going to structure your data. I right. think at that point, it's almost like this situation where you store in Mongo knowing that maybe later it's going to have to go to a relational store. Um, and maybe, I don't think there's a good do do solution. Reporting? Like, I know that's a huge generic question. So you have your data. What is the best practice for the, okay, the enterprise customer now wants analytics and whatever on earth that means to them is right. irrelevant. What is sort of the process by which you take your Mongo data and you get it into a format that can be reasonably queried maybe even offline from the yeah. app for the purpose of this analytics. Sure. So what we've done is we, um, like I said, we, we have this Postgres bridge. That's kind of the first step. Um, we also store our, so since Mongo stores in JSON, we actually generate JSON files, flat files of JSON. Um, and we just have a huge, like they're very large files stored on S3. And then we run yeah, Elastic MapReduce uh, jobs, which are offline data processing jobs on them, to kind of crunch things. Not it's not going to be in real time, but uh, it's like a nightly job. So I think Mongo. I think a positive of Mongo is it's pretty good at getting data out of it. And so whatever, I mean, all databases are though. But whatever. Um, I think yeah. I think it's easy to export. Since you're no longer writing uh, Rails migrations to affect the schema or change columns or add them, are you still writing them, though, to move the data around, the existing data yeah. structures? Yeah. So um, we can, you can either use the Rails migration system for that. Um, we don't use it too much. We actually almost always just write um, write tasks to do that after we deploy. Um, when like local developers. Right, for local developers, um, we e either tell each other to write those, to tell, tell each other to run those, or we actually just have everyone uh, refresh from staging their data, and that data would, is already in the right schema. So, yes. 
So, um, so, so I was wondering about how uh, this kind of no SQL database is going to compare to like this indexing, so uh, Elasticsearch indexing, right? And um, so, so our, my like problem is I have these really complex XML files and I upload them to um, like a Postgres and then we index the Postgres into, into Elasticsearch. And it seems like what we get is something that might be the same as what you're doing here in the Mongo. Like, it, it's just a series of JSON objects that you can just kind of like query against, but it queries really fast. And I think the important thing for us is that we don't have to know all the you know, fields and attributes in these XML files that end up right. in JSON, right? And uh, so I'm kind of wondering, like, so is it the same thing? So the, this index over here seems like it's just a bunch of JSON files, and I can do the same thing with a Mongo, but so I'm just kind of asking my question, I guess. Is it actually the same? Is it the same as Elasticsearch? Or how does it compare? Right. So, like, so Elasticsearch know? is a full text search engine that uses JSON, that the, the, the format is JSON. Yeah. Um, not where I work now, but my former colleague had was doing this where he was using a Mongo for his data and Elasticsearch for full text search because Mongo actually didn't have full text search back then. And um, Mongo is like Elasticsearch is still much better for full text search than Mongo. So it's not it's not if you're using Elasticsearch and the advanced capabilities, you you probably should stick with it. Um, the Mongo's full text search is good if. Mongo is like kind of powering your existing app, and you just want a little bit of full text search with it. But Elasticsearch is a better full text search. But so, what if could I like index the Mongo DB the database? So essentially, the um, yeah. Well, you would have you would export the JSON in the Mongo DB to Elasticsearch, and then Elasticsearch would index it. Yeah. yeah okay. Thanks. Hmm? Complex index creation, like Speak adding up. multiple types oh. of documents into a single index and doing reductions on those uh, map results into so, documents, essentially. All right, so the question is, does Mongo support indexes across multiple documents, like multiple collections, like a post and a um, a post and a, I guess, author or something? Yeah. No, it's it's very uh, each Mongo query is for one collection because there's no joins. So when you're querying Mongo, it's it's one collection type. So you're just querying posts, you're just querying author. Uh, there is no way to go across it. Does Raven do that? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have joins though. It's just you map two different things into a thing that has the same shape, mm -hmm. and then you can very cool. run reductions on those. It's all JSON as well. Cool. Just, I'm just curious what kind of stuff it supports. Oh, I should just go. Read How does Mongoloid handle documents that have keys that aren't defined in your schema? Like if you had a bad migration or some external tool added something to the document and your, um, your ODM doesn't have right. that data defined? Um, so if, like, let's say you have uh, a field called that somehow is in there that's called like foo, but then in Mongoloid there's no definition for a field named foo. Um, it will. Um, it's been I actually. It will either just throw an error because it doesn't know, but if you use the so I actually don't know about Mongo. It's Mongoid, but for the Ruby driver, um, because you always just pass in a string as the key, it will find it. Um, I think with Mongoid, if you do like dot foo dot field name, it probably will throw an error. But if you do the hash syntax, which is like a blog post and then hash and then a string as the value, uh, it will find it because it's at that point it's a string. Yeah. The field name is a string. Great. Thanks, everyone.